hello, welcome back. So in this uh, mini lesson, we're going to take a look at another example of the test cross, which I used as a definition on my last video. Um, and then we're going to take a look at monohybrid and dihybrid crosses, seeing how um, we can predict the genotypes and phenotypes of offspring based on the genotypes and the phenotypes of the parents. So using Punnett squares as a tool to help us predict um, the genetic the inheritance patterns basically of traits that we're following. All right, so last time I ended with the definition of a test cross, which is a way that you can determine the mystery genotype of an organism that you know its phenotype. So again, uh, if you're still kind of struggling with the vocabulary, heterozygous, homozygous, phenotype, genotype, make sure you're comfortable with those words because I'm now going to be using them in from here on out. Get help, ask for clarification if those are still um, a sticking point for you. All right, so in the definitions or the vocabulary mini lesson, I use the example of a tall and a short plant. In this picture, this is from your book, I believe, um, they're using guinea pigs. So here's our mystery. So our mystery guinea pig is a black guinea pig, right? So we had a black guinea pig and we did not know, we don't know whether the black guinea pig was homozygous dominant or homozygous recessive. So right here's our question. Is it big B, big B or big B, little B? And we're using B, we designated B for fur color. So the gene is fur color. The capital B is for a dominant. The, little, the lowercase b is for recessive, right? So we always assign just one letter per gene. So remember, in a test cross, you're going to take your mystery organism, in this case, it's the black guinea pig, and we're gonna cross it with a true breeding homozygous recessive because the nature of what a homozygous recessive is, is its phenotype, that's the only combination you can have. So for, in this case, lowercase b, little b, little b, is the brown phenotype. So homozygous recessive is gonna give the brown phenotype. So let's say in this test cross, let's say we cross our black guinea pig with a brown guinea pig and 100% of the babies, all these cute little babies are have black fur, okay? So that tells us by um, kind of deduction of this problem, that if the, the black guinea pig was the male and the brown guinea pig was the female, if it's, the female can only donate little b alleles. That's a law of segregation. So if all she has is little b, little b, that's all that can be found in her egg cells. So for her to have all black babies, 100% of the sperm coming from this mystery male had to have been um, the capital letter, the dominant letter. So that tells you that 100% of the babies are hybrid, are heterozygous. If that was the case, then we would know that our daddy here, our guinea pig, had to have been homozygous dominant. Had to have been, because there's no other way he would have gotten 100% black guinea pigs by crossing a black and a brown guinea pig. That has to be. Now, if we do the big or, what if we did it and we got a different outcome? So again, we are gonna take our homozygous recessive brown female, again, law of segregation. She can only make eggs that have the uh, recessive allele. But if we take a look, if the male happened to be heterozygous, he can produce two different kinds of sperm because he has two versions to donate, that law of segregation. So here's your diploid in the beginning of meiosis, and by the time you get to the end of meiosis, you will have haploid gametes that have one copy of each allele. Since if he was a heterozygote, he would have half of his sperm would be containing the dominant allele, and half of the sperm would be containing the recessive allele. So with the 100% recessive from the mom, and half dominant and half recessive from the dad, we would have 50% be heterozygous, black, and 50% be homozygous recessive. So if that was the outcome, we could say, oh, the daddy was a homozygous, or sorry, heterozygous, a hybrid. So it's not that both of these outcomes would happen, it's one or the other. You're gonna take your black guinea pig of a mystery genotype, you don't know what its allele combination is, you cross that with a homozygous recessive, this is our test cross, and here are your two possibilities. If 100% are black, 
the dads are homozygous dominant. If 50% are black and 50% are brown, the dad is heterozygous. That's just how it is. So this is what a test cross is. It's just another example of a test cross. All right. So when we take a look at a monohybrid cross, so mono, what does that mean? One. And hybrid is a mix. So it's one trait. We're following one trait. And the parents are both hybrids. So a hybrid is going to be a dominant and a recessive. And I'm just picking T's here, but it could be any letter combination. So we have a guinea pig example and we have a flower example. They're both going to end up with the same ratios of offspring in that F1 um, and F2 generation. All right, so starting off with Mendel's language, here's our P generation. We have a true, true breeding black guinea pig. So we know it's black, black is dominant. Oops, that's not what I wanted to say. In this case, black is dominant. Brown is recessive. It always helps to write a key, kind of set up the information that you know. Um, and I'll be going through this as we get into deep into some of the deeper genetics problems. But setting up your known values are really helpful. I think there's some suggestions in your genetics problems in your lab this week that will help you work through some of these. So let's say we have a um, homozygous dominant male, that's a true breeding male and a homozygous recessive female, that's a true breeding female. So by the laws of segregation, 100% of the eggs, did I say that backwards? I think the last slide got me mixed up. So in this case, the homozygous dominant is the female, the homozygous recessive is in the male. 100% of the eggs are going to have the dominant allele because that's all that she has to donate in her meiosis. The brown guinea pig, the male, 100% of the sperm are going to be carrying the recessive allele because that's all that he has to give. And if we cross those, we will get 100% black heterozygous. Okay, so this is our F1 generation. So F1 generation is the cross of your parental generation. You will always get 100% hybrids when you cross two true breeding parents. That's just the way it works. Now, let's say you cross, uh, you get your F1 generation, you get an egg and a sperm from those, and then we are going to cross those. So if you are heterozygous, so this is your 2N, you do the law of segregation, you can make gametes that are 1N that have the big B, and you can make gametes, right? So this is our 1N generation. So these are your two choices. So from the F1 generation, because you're 100% heterozygous, when you make your gametes, you have a choice. So half of the gametes are going to be carrying the dominant allele. Half of the gametes will be carrying the recessive allele. Now, if you cross your F1 hybrids, this is our F2, right? So F2 down here at the bottom. We can see in a Punnett square, so these little boxes are called a Punnett square, so if this egg happened to get fertilized by this sperm, you're going to get a big B, big B combination. So the phenotype will be black, the genotype will be homozygous dominant. If this egg happens to be fertilized by this sperm, you will still get a black phenotype, but your genotype will be heterozygous. Pick a different color. If this egg, happens to be fertilized by this sperm, you will get a black phenotype, but you will have a heterozygous genotype. And if this egg happens to get fertilized with this sperm, you will have a brown guinea pig and you will be homozygous recessive. So these Punnett squares help you set up the gametes that are made from your parents, put all the potential crosses together and figure out what your offspring can be. So in this case, we could have 25% big B, big B, 50% big B, little b, and 25% little b, little b. Okay. So we could use our language, our special words, right? So we have 25% homozygous dominant, 50% heterozygous, 25% homozygous recessive. 
these would be what we call genotypic ratios. It is the percentage, the ratio of the offspring of the genotypes, that's the letter combinations. But what would the phenotypic ratios be? Because remember, homozygous dominant and heterozygous organisms have the same phenotype. So big B, big B, and big B, little b have the same phenotype. So this is gonna be 75% black babies and 25%, I'm running out of room, 25% brown, right? And this is what Mendel found way back when he was doing the pea plants, is he would find what was called a three to one ratio. No matter how many plants he planted, he would, if he planted a thousand F2, uh, F1 crosses and grew up the F2 generation, if he planted a thousand pea plants, and he was tracking, say, flower color, 750 of them would be the dominant allele, and 25, 250 of them would be the recessive allele. <clears throat> so we can see this in the flower as well. So I kind of wrote, wrote all over the screen for the guinea pig, so I won't write quite as much, but it's the same case. If we have a heterozygous um, male and a heterozygous female, we will get 75% the dominant phenotype, that's the purple, and 25% the recessive phenotype, which is white. And this is what we call a three to one phenotypic, it's not ration, ratio. I have three to one phenotypic ratio. Genotypic ratio would be 25 to 50 to 25. If we're looking at homozygous dominant, heterozygous, homozygous recessive. If we're looking at the phenotypes, that's the color, the purple, the white, the brown, the black, whatever that physical characteristic is, that would be the phenotypic ratio. So again, keep track of those vocabulary words. Make sure you're reading what the question is asking, whether it's gonna be talking about a phenotypic ratio, which would be the appearance, or the genotypic ratio, which would be the letter combinations. Okay, so that's our monohybrid cross. We're now gonna get into a dihybrid cross, which is a little bit more trickier because we're gonna be following two traits. So before we move on to the dihybrid, pause, make sure you're comfortable with the mono. So when we are doing a dihybrid cross, we are following two traits, dihybrid. So it's two genes, each with their own alleles, and we're starting with hybrid crosses, okay? So here's our to get the hybrids, we have to start with our true breeding parents. So in this case, we are doing guinea pigs again, and our traits are going to be for color and for length. So let's jot down our key. Here's my keyboard so I don't accidentally bump it. So if we are going to keep track of our traits, we are going to say fur color, right? So black is dominant. And that could be, those would be our genotypes. Brown is recessive. And those are genotypes, right? That's, that's for one trait. The other one is fur length. I'm having a hard time writing today with my finger. So we have long. Oh, let's do the dominant first. Okay, so we have short is dominant and long is recessive. When I pick letters for problems, I usually like to try to pick letters that have really distinct capital and lowercase. So like H's and B's and A's, C's and S's are a little bit harder to do because of capital C and a lowercase c, they're only difference by size, not by shape. So that's just kind of something that I do to make it so I'm not going to accidentally get confused if I happen to write a capital C small, I might mistake that for a lowercase c. But I'm just using S here because that's what's in the picture. So here's your key. Jot that down. I'm going to have to erase it because I don't have a lot of room. 
So keeping track that our fur color, black is dominant, brown is recessive, and these are the genotypes that go along with those traits. For fur length, short is dominant, long is recessive, and those are the genotypes that go along with these traits. Okay, so pause if you wanna jot those down because I'm gonna erase them. You can always look at the parents too. So the parents are kind of giving you clues as to what those, uh, kind of the key is, what, what are starting information. So I'm doing homeschooling, my son's doing word problems, you gotta figure out what information is given to you in the question. That's a great skill that lasts you all the way through general biogenetics, right? <laughs> okay, so now what we need to do is we need to figure out the law of segregation, right? What kind of gametes are these organisms going to be able to produce when they go through meiosis? It's really easy for the parental generation because they're true breeding. That's the only alleles that they can give are 100% of what they have. So for our parents, this is the boy because it's the sperm producer, they only have capital letters to give. So 100% of their sperm are going to be big, a, big B, big S. And for the mom, 100% of her eggs are going to be lowercase. That's easy. That's all that they have. When those cross, you're going to get your F1 generation and you will have 100% hybrid, hybrid for both traits. Because if you'll notice, it's big B, little b, and big S, little s. Now we're just tracking them both at the same time. We could have done them individually as monohybrids um, to see this, but now we're seeing that they are 100% um, heterozygous. Now let's take some egg and sperm from this F1 generation. Again, we wouldn't do this in humans because it's inbreeding and it would be disastrous, but in guinea pigs apparently and in plants, it's okay. So let's say you have, this is your genotype, okay? As a diploid, right? You are 2N and your goal is to make haploid gametes. You're gonna have four haploid gametes. That's the end of meiosis, right? Chapter 10 stuff. So what we need to figure out is what is all the possible combinations of alleles with one B and one S that we could produce in the process of meiosis, okay? So in all the possible combinations, we have two Bs that we could give, right? We could have a big B in half of our offspring, and we could have a little B in half of our offspring, okay? So those are the possible combinations. That's about all we can do. For the S's, it's the same idea. We could have a big S, but we don't wanna write it again because that would be the same. So let's put that other big S with the little b. And then our other possibility is a little s. Oops. Little s and a little s. So those are all the possible combinations. Now, sometimes you, uh, I like to draw arrows. Now, hopefully this isn't gonna get too confusing. So I'll try, maybe I got all these colors that might help. So my big b's are going here and my little bees are going here. So I tried to do some color coding there. Now with my S's, my big S's are going here and my little S's are going here. I know it's a lot of lines, it may or may not make sense. But what we should be able to see is that with our hybrid of two traits, the fur color and the fur length, we have made all the possible combinations that we can make in our haploid gametes. And if you'll notice, this is what we see on our Punnett square. Now, instead of a four square Punnett square, we have a 16 square Punnett square to keep track of all of these crosses. So just like with a four square Punnett square, you bring down all the potential combinations. So I'll, maybe I'll use a highlighter in this one. So here we have, if the egg is one of these ones, right, the big B, big S, and the sperm also happens to have that genotype, the big B, big S, we would end up with homozygous dominant for both traits. And if you go back to the key that you wrote down that I had to erase, we would see that big B, big B is black fur, and big S, big S is short fur. So this particular offspring 
is going to look just like dad, okay? Black short hair. Now, we don't know whether it's a boy or a girl. That's not part of this. We're not tracking that. All we're saying is these are the traits that it happened to have. Now, if you continue to do that, we can find all of the other offspring potentials that's going to have black short fur. So I'm going to highlight those. Black short fur, black short fur, black short, black short, black short, black short, black short. Okay, so all of those are highlighted in yellow. And if you'll notice, they have various combinations of those alleles. But the thing that you should see is every single one of those has at least one capital allele, the dominant allele, in one of those two positions. So each one of them has a capital B somewhere, and each one of those has a capital S somewhere. They might be heterozygous, like the F1 generation, or they might be some combination of homozygous dominant and heterozygous in either the B or the S. All right, let me pick a different color. So now let's say we have a heterozygous egg fusing with a heterozygous sperm, right? So this will give us something like this, black long hair. So heterozygous for dominant with the, not heterozygous, I, I shouldn't have said that. So dominant uh, fur color and a recessive fur length gene is going to give us a black long hair and now let's see all the combinations they're going to give us that right here all right so i kind of highlighted everything in green that's going to be giving us that combination okay so we've got black short and now we have black long so if we've, we've covered all of the dominant colors um for color gene now let's see what if we have, that's purple, hopefully that's not too dark. What if we start off with a recessive fur color, this guy right here? That's gonna give us brown short, all right, and this one too. That's gonna give us brown short, brown short. So here we have the recessive fur color with the dominant fur length. And then lastly, we do some orange kind of circle these. They're gonna to get to play a role in three different mixings. So this last one, we have homozygous recessive for both the fur color and the fur length. So what that gives us is what we call a nine, so let me find my colors here, highlighter yellow. We have a nine, so all of the guinea pigs that have this particular phenotype, black, short fur, there's nine out of 16 of those. For the green, these are all black long hair. So the dominant fur color, recessive fur length. And then we had purple. Three of those were the brown short hair. And then lastly, we had one combination that was recessive for both, brown long hair. So Mendel also came up with this when he was tracking two traits at a time. He called this the nine, three, three, one phenotypic ratio, where in the monohybrid cross, it was a three to one phenotypic ratio. This produces a nine, three, three, one uh, phenotypic ratio for the dihybrid cross, okay? So my takeaway message for this, I know it's a lot keeping track of all these letters. So that's why it's super important. You just use one letter per gene. Write down a key so you can keep track of who's dominant, who's recessive, what the genotypes match with what phenotypes, and then make sure when you're generating your gametes, you're always going from the diploid potential to the haploid offspring, and all the possible combinations, and this is what you're going to use to populate your boxes on your Punnett squares. All right, so that's our monohybrid cross, our dihybrid cross lesson. I will see you next time.